Thank you, Tommy Dazard and the Go Go Mobile Band for your rendition of our theme. And welcome to episode 19 <laughs> of the Champagne Comedy Podcast, <laughs> where we like to talk about the best comedy show in the 90s ever made, The Late Show, and other degeneration comedy tidbits. My name is Matt, and joining this podcast today is Alison Daniel. <laughs> Kim, you know what? I wrote down uh, Prue and Tony on here, but they decided not to join us. So thank you very much, Alison, <laughs> Daniel, and Kim. Hello. Hello. Hey. And I am not going to edit any of that start out. So that's going to <laughs> go straight good plan. Good plan. Uh, I'm in a good mood tonight. And I hope everyone's been well and, uh, yeah, just pretty much the same old stuff since uh, last episode, really, isn't it? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, we'll get into... And we have an email from a very keen Late Show fan. This is not really feedback. It's more or less uh, an appreciation for the Late Show and as well as the cast because this is uh, from Kenny Liu. And he says, hello, uh, I like the show so much and I love it that I met Judith Lucy at the book event that she had a recent uh, book signing, I believe, a, a book published, and I enjoyed it so much. I am saying that so I had fun and I really love it and I really enjoyed it a lot. Sorry, I'm trying to read exactly what he's written here. So mm -hmm. um, I have not edited it for typos. And he sent us some photos of him and Judith together. Uh, and he's posted the photos on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. So if you saw any retweets or anything like that, that's him. And he just wants to say that he, yes, we want The Late Show to be shown on iView and on the ABC uh, to show reruns of The Late Show and that will be good to have it. Uh, uh, apart, apart from the syntax, uh, we, uh, we wholeheartedly agree. He also says, I do like barge ass, but I like four farts in 30 seconds. I'm just saying that. I <laughs> yeah. hope the late show. Good, 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 good little joke in that. Um, oh, that's that's very far along in the series as well. Yeah, that will be season two, a bit further on. Yeah. He also says, "I hope the late show will be on iView, and we wanted to bring it on iView." Sure, I will hear from you soon. And my last word is die shitsu, but he censored shit in die shitsu and barjas. So, mate. Kenny, welcome to the group. Glad that you uh, yeah. love the Light Show as much as everyone else who decides to listen to this as well. Yeah. That's if you're listening, Kenny. So yeah, if he's listening. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much, Kenny. And yeah, we don't have any control over the Light Show. We would love it to be on uh, iView too. But as we're going through, this is actually how this podcast started because we're fans. We have no control over it. We and this podcast is not associated with Working Dog, ABC, etc. We're just recapping episodes to fill that gap, really. And this is our own VHS mm -hmm. copies. So that's what this podcast is all about. Plus, we have an update on the Champagne Comedy Quote Competition. Oh, Ooh, great. Yay. It, this is really it. So um, you can't really enter anymore after this episode <laughs> because we will reveal the winner in episode 20. But this is the collection so far. Careful. There's three cubicles and one of them contains a pong. Oh, my eyes burning. Game over. Tough. <laughs> Uncompromising, no holds barred, no beg your pardons. It's time for those intentional sparring partners, Graham and the bloody Colonel. No, I am not the man from the Where's Wally books. I'm tired of people walking up to me and saying, found you. What's all that about? I made love to her like a tiger. G'day from uh, Dominic, how are you? Do you believe in mental telepathy? No, I hear you think. I may be ugly, but at least I never <laughs> be as ugly as an angular web. You forgot the bad language? Shit. <laughs> well, we have one more entry, and guess what? Alison, we finally got someone in response to your request, and that is we have a female. Wow. Hasta la vista, little fat kid. <laughs> Fantastic. That's from Melissa. So mm. thank you very much, Melissa. We can yeah. finally break up the the all male dominant quotes, really. Yeah. Well Sausage done. Sausage party's Melissa. over, yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Melissa. Yes, you are in the draw, and I'll quickly recap the prizes. 
So you have the Ripper Vinyl, which uh, is pre-loved. Utopia Seasons 1 and 2 on DVD. Thank you to Kim. Mulvania, as well as the D-Gen Bumper Book of Aussie Heroes. Thank you very much, Alison. And Lucky Grills cass Cassette Tape Volume 3. <laughs> I think that's all of it. Shampoo oh yes indeed so uh, I'm sure you're going to get your four farts in 30 seconds off that tape I just realised I forgot one more thing any questions for Ben the DVD the unopened DVD oh yes how, <laughs> yeah, how, yeah, how do we somehow you've, you've, forget that you've, you've mentioned mm. it every time <laughs> I, right? I just saw it down there and it was covered by uh, the, the Utopia DVD so my apologies there we go <laughs> so um, yeah that's pretty much it and I'm just got to work out how to draw that damn thing because they're all damn good. Thank you so much, everyone. Hopefully we won't, we won't have to put it to a Eurovision-style 50% you know, uh, jury, 50% televoting sort of a thing. <laughs> it's time for Daniel G and his program guide. Daniel, please take it away. So episode 18 was on the 21st of November, but episode 19, which is what we're go about to go through, uh, was broadcast on the 5th of December. What happened in the intervening week on the 28th of November was a best-of special. Um, ostensibly... Uh, uh, doing uh, requests uh, from the audience, which is always a bit of an iffy uh, sort of a premise as to whether they actually received um, requests or not. Uh, the only reason I, I bring up uh, the uh, the missing week is because there were quite a few blockbusters uh, that uh, that aired on that same night. Because usually up against the late show, it's been movies. Uh, but uh, on the 28th of November, Hey Hey It's Saturday had a special three-hour 21st birthday show, which uh, included Bon Jovi. And if you couldn't get enough Bon Jovi, they were also appearing on Channel 10 in the Coca-Cola Australian Music Awards, live from Dreamworld on the Gold Coast. I'm also appearing with John Paul Young, Paul Mercurio and Girlfriend. <laughs> Girlfriend? <laughs> Take it from yeah. yeah, that's the, that's yeah. the song. There's, there is YouTube footage of them performing it uh, yeah, in that uh, big stadium at Dreamworld. And after the Australian Music Awards, there was the John Farnham 25th anniversary celebration hosted by Bert Newton. So, yeah, there was there was quite, quite a lot of stuff you, you would have uh, missed, um, yeah, if you were just looking at the late show. Uh, even the listing um, done by Ross Warnicke was uh, a bit longer than usual. He wrote, sometimes hilarious, often tasteless and thoroughly unpredictable local live comedy sketch series. So I think it's starting to turn around on it. Like it's not, mm. that, that that doesn't, well, unless it's a backhanded uh, one, it's uh, certainly complimentary. So anyhow, uh, yeah, going to uh, what's up against um, season one, episode 19. As I mentioned every uh, episode, uh, this is Ross Warnicke's critical guide to the weekend's TV where he gets to uh, comment on uh, what's in the listings. So on Channel 7, up against Episode one, uh, episode 19, Series 1, rather, uh, is the 1973 thriller Day of the Jackal. Uh, says Warnicke, Edward Fox plays an assassin recruited to kill French President Charles de Gaulle in this intelligent and, in, and absorbing adaptation of Frederick Forsyth's bestseller. Director Fred Zinnemann's creation of suspense as the jackal meticulously prepares for the job while police try to locate him is masterful. Now, on Channel 9, no hey hey. As far as I can tell, it might have finished um, for the year uh, with that uh, three-hour blowout. Or they might just have been uh, sleeping it off. It might return next week. I'm not sure. Uh, in its place, though, was um, a special hosted by Richard Wilkins called Big Break, recognising eight young Australians, followed by Motor Rallying. Uh, highlights of the race through the forests of Western Australia. I think I would have preferred <laughs> Hey Hey, to be honest. Um, and then at 8.30, a 1990 Australian suspense uh, called The Sure Mountain Killings Mystery, starring Tom Richards, Abigail and Stephen Jacobs. The Cordeaux family home is burgled and a gemstone that is said to have an ancient curse on it is stolen. Gradually, a force takes control of their lives and they are drawn towards the Sure Mountains. Wow. Now on That's this 10, tax break, doesn't it, it does. that film? <laughs> it, it just sounds like a tax break. Yeah, considering it's uh, yeah, from, from a couple of years ago, I've, I've got a feeling like it might have also been aired. Like, again, I think this is starting to become the non-ratings period, so you're starting to see such gems as motor rallying and, uh, yeah, Australian telemovies. <laughs> 
And yeah, I, I do think it is non ratings period because on Channel 10 at 8 o'clock, they've got the premiere of a new Australian comedy series set in a panel beating shop starring Shane Bourne and Russell Gilbert. Does anybody remember the name of this one? Yep, I do. But please tell everyone what it is. Oh, Bingles. You never know what's round the corner. Who you're going to bump into today. Bingles. Which, as far as I can tell, one was sort of a, 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 a starring vehicle for some of the people coming out of the comedy company. And second of all, wasn't very good and, uh, yeah, didn't go past one series. They dumped it at 8 o'clock on a Saturday as well. So, again, it doesn't seem like a prime viewing sort of a time slot. It was after half an hour of, of Benny Hill repeats as well. Uh, then at 8.30, uh, again, another Australian film from 1988, um, an uneven film adaptation by David Williamson of his play called Emerald City. Uh, it's about a couple of precious inner urban types played by John Hargraves and Robin Nevin who moved to the hedonistic hustle of Sydney, also starring Chris Hayward and Ruth Cracknell. I say, Arthur. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I always have to do that whenever I, I hear her name. I can't think of her without her saying that immortal line from uh, Mother and Son. Uh, over on SBS, we've got a 1958 French-Brazilian drama called Black Orpheus. A Khan and Oscar winner, this modern interpretation of the Greek myth is set in Rio de Janeiro, uh, directed by Marcel Camus with Breno Mello and Marpessa Dorn. I don't know what I just said uh, just then. <laughs> said it very impressively. <laughs> I think I pronounced it all correctly. Uh, and back on the ABC, the lead-ins at 8.30, we've got The Bill, uh, says Warnicky, consistently good British police drama. Then at 9.30, Bread, says Warnicky, British comedy series. Uh, <laughs> then The Late Show at 10, sometimes hilarious live comedy sketch series. Then Order in the House at 11 and at midnight, Rage playing uh, an ACDC special. So, wow. yeah, pl plenty of stuff there, even though it is non-ratings. All right, now it's time for Season 1, Episode 19 of The Late Show, broadcast Saturday, December 5th, 1992. And we have the opening, which is the program guide that pops up on the screen, and it's with Tony announcing it. What was it, Tony yeah, or Tony. Mick? Oh, sorry, or, Tony, Tony, yeah. Tony putting uh, his best sort of humorous announcer voice. He sort of puts a little laugh in it. Yes. So <laughs> That sort of thing. This is slightly political, this episode, well, just a tiny little bit because <laughs> it is after the late show is Sticky Moments with Phil Cleary. So that's a great play on Gillian Cleary's name as well. But you'll find out a bit later on what Phil Cleary is all about. Now we have, after the opening titles, we've got the opening remarks with Mick and Tony on stage. Hey, everybody, <laughs> let's make this the best ever second yeah. to last show in television. <laughs> <ever>. <laughs> <laughs> That was probably the phoniest, spontaneous <laughs> round of applause I've ever heard. Now, Tony uh, talks about how he ran into Phil Cleary, and running into him, he means that Phil was cleaning his windscreen. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, because, you, yeah, we might as well explain what the Phil Cleary scenario is all about. Right. Well, I've done a bit of research into Phil Cleary, and this is quite an interesting story. So this goes back all the way to December 1991 when there was a leadership spill in federal parliament. And this was when um, Paul Keating challenged Bob Hawke for the leadership of the Labour Party and the prime ministership, and he won. And then Hawke found himself back on the back benches. And, f and so therefore Hawke becomes merely the member for Wills, which is a seat in Melbourne. And Hawke stayed on the back benches for a couple of months, and then he decided to resign the seat of Wills in February 1992, which meant that there was a by-election held in Wills in April 1992, at which independent candidate Phil Cleary stood for the seat. Now, this was, this was a pretty interesting by-election because 22 people stood for election. Most of them were independents. Wow. Yeah, 22 people, which, which is quite an extraordinary number of people. I, I, don't know, I don't know precisely what was going on in Wills at this point because 22 sort of candidates seems huge. But anyway, this is what happened. Now, Phil Cleary, he was a school teacher, but, but also he was well known in Victoria because he was a VFA player and later he was a VFA coach and then he became a commentator on the ABC for their VFA coverage. So he had quite a high profile, particularly amongst those who liked football. And he actually won the, the Wills by-election in April 1992. 
He defeated the Labour candidate by less than 3,000 votes, but, but he definitely did win. However, the bloke who came eighth, who was another independent candidate, a guy called Ian Sykes, he contested the results on the grounds that Phil Cleary had been working as a teacher for the Victorian government for part of his election campaign. And this is actually illegal under Section 44 of the Australian Constitution. Section 44 is not a, a recent thing. No, sec- Section 40, well, th- this, is, this, this whole thing is all about Section 44 and about parts of Section 44 you have never heard of probably. So under Section 44, which is, I suppose, most famous for this scandal around foreign citizenship, um, there's also another part of it, which is that you're not allowed to hold an office of profit under the Crown and essentially what that means is you're not allowed to work for the government. And because Phil Cleary had still been employed as a teacher for part of his campaign, he therefore was ineligible to win the seat of Wills, OK? So Ian Sykes goes off to the High Court and they fine for Sykes. So Phil Cleary therefore was ineligible to stand and had to step down. But Sykes also challenged the eligibility of the second place winner, who was the Labour candidate, on the grounds that the Labour candidate had been born in Greece and hadn't renounced his Greek citizenship when he took Australian citizenship. Oh, but wow. and this is wow. this is where I need Matt to step in with the pedantry sound effect here. Pedantry. <laughs> Thank you very much. You you might need this a bit later. Because not only did <laughs> not only did Sykes challenge the, the Labour candidate who came second, he also challenged the eligibility of the Liberal candidate who became third because the Liberal candidate had been born in Switzerland and, again, had been naturalised as an Australian citizen but had not renounced his Swiss citizenship. So wow. pedantry again for Mr Sykes there. Pedantry. Thank you very much. So, so therefore, the High Court basically said, you're going to have to have another by-election. This, this is in. They decided this in November 1992, which is why in this episode of the Late Show they're talking about it. Now they decided that they weren't going to hold another by-election in Wills because there was going to be a federal election early in 1993, and so they didn't do that. And then they held the federal election in 1993. Phil Cleary ran again, and he won, and he held the seat of Wills until the 1996 by-election, uh, 1996 federal election, and then he lost the seat. And the reason he lost the seat was because there was a boundary change in the seat of Wills. So th- that that is a very, very long story, but but that is basically the Phil Cleary story. And and watching this episode of The Late Show, whenever they mention Phil Cleary, and they mention him multiple times in the episode and there's more to come, you, you can see that the, the Melbourne audience, some of whom would have lived in Wills and probably voted for Phil Cleary or knew who he was or had heard this story for the six months it had been going on, you can, you can really feel that there's quite a lot of high feeling about this story, you know. Wow. So, so they react to it quite strongly, and and that is, that's the Phil Cleary story. Wow, that, that that's amazing. Mm. And the thing that fast forward years later, you had the nearly dissolving of a lot of parliamentary members because of a not not exactly that, but half of what Cleary went through yeah. because of the you're yeah, not renouncing. Wow. So you think they would have been yeah. warned about that previously. <laughs> okay, well, we better go through it all, but it's been, I guess, that long since um, and they've all had the new parliamentary members come in. But, yeah, yeah that's well, pe- double people the have been got Cleary. People have been got under Section 44 lots and lots of times over the past 100 or so years, mostly on the yeah. on the citizenship thing. But but I think it I think it's sort of um, it's it's less common for people to be got on this um, profiting under the crown part of Section 44. Mm. So I guess that's that's what's unique about the Phil Cleary case. Yeah, and how wow. long exactly was he a teacher with this overlap that occurred? Maybe it was just a couple of days or something and, you know, yeah, how, how did they prove? Was. Yeah, how did they actually prove that he started campaigning when he was still technically employed? Did he have a pay slip or something that covered that period? It was a very short period. I understand mm-hmm. it. I think I think he just failed to step down before he started campaigning or something like this. But anyway, they got him, and he stepped down and he he copped it, and then he he ran again, having not worked as a teacher during that campaign period, and he won. And and I suspect that probably a big part in his victory was the fact that 
that the people of Wills had voted for him and they were probably a bit bored slash outraged at, <laughs> at Ian Sykes' pedantry over this because it, you know. Pedantry. I mean, this went on for seven months, this whole story. This this would have been in the papers and on the news in Victoria for seven months. So as we get to it later on in the episode, you could kind of see that query did a bit of an eye roll. It's like, you know, here or there or the other, whatever, you, depends on the way that you read into it. So he gives his own. Pedantry. Yep. Yeah. Having said that, what, what he did and what the other candidates was wrong under the law, so I suppose it's fair enough that they lost. But, yeah, that that's Section 44 for you, everyone's favourite part of the Constitution. Well, thank you very much for dissecting or having our own Parliament question time in a way. <laughs> or, or, no, no, Insiders. Is it Insiders? What's the one that's on ABC in the mornings? It's Insiders where they talk about the political crap. Yeah, and Insiders yeah. when it's sport. Yeah, that's right. No, offsiders. Is it offsiders or no? <laughs> offsiders. offsiders is a small There's one. Al- Outsiders is the weird Sky News one. Ah, yes, of yeah. course. Well, thank you, Alison, for doing a lot of research for that. You've done a lot more than what you should have for this podcast. Ah, uh, Wikipedia, everyone. If you if you want to hear about um, Sykes versus Cleary, it's all on Wikipedia. All right. And now, after uh, your dosage of Phil Cleary, we have some booze time, really. Oh, funny that. <laughs> and Mick has spent it. <laughs> Mick has spent his week off his nut because of John Singleton's politically incorrect Eagle Bitter campaigns, and that's where the teaser came in. How do you spot a beer man? Well, that's not a beer man's job, and that's not a beer man's dog. That's not a beer man's big night out. That's what a beer man's not. And it did what it said. He was purposely trying to stir shit up, really. Yeah. And it got the attention and it worked. Well, that, that's that's exactly what it says because that, that ad has been put up by Pepper Studios who, who produced it. Uh, yeah, as it says in, in the description, a politically incorrect ad for Eagle, Pit, uh, for Eagle Bitter, it was made purposely to create public comment for John Singleton's agency. It worked. We featured <laughs> on all news and current affairs shows nationally. And Mick does go on to explain that Singer's concept was to say that a bloke would admire a <laughs> Billboard of El McPherson, for example, far away and say, I would love to have a beer with her. <laughs> so, and it all comes down to all the delivery when it's like Mick's mates will go, geez, I would love to root her. Mick's got some excellent delivery of, of those, uh, of some lines in, in this um, uh, sing a bit. Yeah. Well, the part which uh, was a bit weird was uh, when Mick came to the conclusion that Singo and his beer were a little bit... And that's when they started the chant with the audience. Sing goes a That's a chant we want to hear. That's what we want to hear up and down the streets of Australia in the next week. Now, uh, that should get the letters coming in, I think. <laughs> chat. <laughs> Uh, the audience really join in with Gusto really, really quickly. And, yeah, I, I, I do feel a, a bit weird, yeah, using that to reference. Um, well, especially nowadays because it seems like there's been a big shift away from beer, really, you know, in towards all towards all these other alcoholic drinks and even zero alcohol drinks. You know, you can, you can go to your soft drink aisle in the supermarket and get zero alcohol Heineken and Carlton Draft. It's not... You know, like it's it's not it's not crappy zero alcohol stuff anymore, really. It's like it's an actual viable option these days. And personally, I'm 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 not a beer man either. I'm I'm more of a cider man. And you're entitled to be a cider yeah. man, mate. Then again, I wasn't a beer person. I did start on my cider as well. I I love my strongbow all because that the office was of strongbow was located at the end of my suburb. Ah. I was a uni student, so that was pretty much the only <laughs> cheap option. That had sub zero. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sub zero. <laughs> mm. And it, but this this ad, it it comes, you know, just before all of those alco pops started to come in. You know, this was this was when the options were basically beer for blokes, you know, women were on the wine cooler or something, right? The West Coast. <laughs> yeah, the yeah. West Coast cooler or something. They, they were basically the two options. You know, but this is this is such a homophobic ad that you know I I I kind of I really enjoy the way that Mick Malloy kind of points out that that actually, you know, he sort of twists it to make to make it seem like like actually the the beer men are actually 
sorry to use that word, but that, that's the word that they use there, uh, you know, because it, because the, the whole ad is basically just saying, you know, you're not, you're not a proper man unless you do, you have a kind of, I don't know, a, a labouring job and you drink beer, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I, I like the way Mick, Mick Malloy twists that. Yeah, they call him out. They call yeah. him out. They really yeah. uh, throw it back at him. Exactly. Big time. So now after the beer chat and Mark Smith from Altona North has sent a Leyland Brothers colouring in book or a fun book mm-hmm. and there's a maze as they open up the book to show that uh, Mal and Mike are in deep financial shit and you got to get them out of that maze. And th- yeah. this was a reference to their fun park, wasn't it, that, that yeah. went back up for them. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a tragic story. We referenced that early on in one of the early episodes, didn't we? Yes. Yeah. And if you actually look up on YouTube, which I, I didn't include it as an audio bite because it does go on for so long as they're trying to explain it in their traditional and typical Leyland terms, that they show a building of behind the scenes of how the theme park came along. And my God, it was boring. <laughs> like, especially to go, the uh, environmentally friendly uh, bush camp uh, tents and stuff like that. And then once you. You walk through the mangroves and stuff that the the man made mangroves and all that. Then they show the museum, the television mu- museum of how they built up their empire and the, all the cameras that they had that they used. And then they show this is how a TV studio works. And we're currently working on a pilot episode for another show. Mm-hmm. It is daggy. Mm-hmm. I will tweet out the YouTube video later on, but you got to watch it too. All, all, all very noble stuff, but th- thank you for sparing us from that uh, in this podcast, Matt. <laughs> You're welcome. And uh, so Mick shows off their first Christmas card that they receive, and that's from Mia Farrow, and the card with the team photo with metal skewers stabbed into it. So, and Tony did warn Mick not to date Sun Yi. Yeah. Obviously, that's still the, that was the ongoing saga between Woody Allen and Mia Farrow. It's it's kind of oddly placed, but um, like much of this monologue, it's sort of it's very short, sharp, and very scathing, really. Now it's time for news desk with Tommy G, and here's the bullet points. Search continues for New South Wales Police Commissioner's lost contact lens, and they show footage of police on hands and knees searching the grass. Bosnia opens world's first military playground, and they show footage of a soldier riding on a rocket launcher that resembles a virtual reality unit. Is that, it's, it's, is that what it was? I had no idea what that I'm guessing was. it was a rocket launcher or it was something or maybe a, it was really weird, but it looked really, really cool and a lot of I, fun. I, I just noted it down as a military doohickey. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then they show footage of a soldier riding on the military doohickey. <laughs> So you're calling it a English. doohickey because you, because you're a cider drinker. You know, if you were a beer man, you'd know what that was. <laughs> A rocket launcher. Yeah. <laughs> That's a beer man's rocket launcher. Absolutely. <laughs> How do you spot a beer man? Yeah. They know what a rocket launcher is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, not a lyric, not, not a real lyric. An English resident takes drastic steps to avoid Mormons. That was a pearl. <laughs> so they show footage of a woman with her door half barricaded. Sandbagged. Yeah. And Elton John unveils the latest hair piece and it shows footage of a elderly woman talking on a microphone wearing a large aqua glasses reminiscent of Elton. <laughs> no. oh, they love their Elton jokes, don't they? What, what's, what's great about this joke is that, is that there's a slight pause once when they cut back to Tommy G after showing that footage and he just goes, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Yeah, exactly, right. Russian Congress off to a fiery start. Communists want the good old days when Stalin and Lenin power and when Merv Hughes was part of a one-day team. Acting Prime Minister Igor Gaida. Is it Gaida? Was it Gaida? No. <laughs> no, it was Igor Gaida. <laughs> no, no, Tom, 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 Tom seemed to, in the episode, pronounce it Gaida. And, yeah, I, I, I put I put check spelling and I didn't, I didn't check the spelling for that, to be honest. <laughs> Pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> well, he showed how to, how he planned to lead the country forward, and he tripped up the stairs. <laughs> so it was a nicer visual thing. I do also like that that uh, Tom tags it with uh, the the soon to be known catchphrase: "Nice work, Eagle." Yeah. <laughs> nice work, Eagle. <laughs> and in Germany, racist violence rocks the country with neo Nazis setting fire to a migrant hostel, and 
their claim was to enter a Windsor Castle lookalike contest. Yeah. Uh, mass protest with ACTU's National Day of Action, marching against reforms with metal workers, nurses, and the members of the Federated Druids Union. So, and even Tommy had no idea what the hell that was. Having a look at, at my VHS copy, uh, I could work out some of the placards that they were holding, and it was stuff like, recycle your dead and give me back my Pete job, my Pete Bog job. And once a oh. and once a cod convict uh, dot 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 and swap one ball and chain for another. So I've sort of I'm still none the wiser as to what they actually were. It certainly wasn't anything that was specially filmed for the late show that was dropped in. Like it looked like actual news footage, but maybe, maybe was it was. This, um, was this students doing street theatre again? Mm-hmm. Quite, <laughs> possibly, quite, yeah, quite possibly. But um, yeah, certainly somebody that that was taking the piss perhaps out of the National Day of Action. Well. Nuclear submarine USS Omaha docked in Port Phillip Bay and in an attempt to beat activists, it anchored six kilometres offshore, but it didn't stop one activist and they show footage of a swimmer underwater holding a Yanks Go Home sign. <laughs> I wonder if that's Tommy or whoever it was who held the tits as well. The sign was um, very well <laughs> painted. Kind of, kind of also reminded me of that classic bit of TV footage of Don Lane and Graham Kennedy doing 76 trombones, one's in Sydney and one's in Melbourne. And, yeah, eventually Graham yeah, pulls out the same, the, well, the same sign, actually, I think. Yeah, go home, yank. And Don Lane cracks up. Yeah. yeah. The coast of Spain was hit by an ecological disaster and 80,000 tonnes of crude oil were leaked into the sea after members of a Greek crew <laughs> went for a swim. Yeah. Yes. We're doing yes. fish on that one. That received quite a few boos and hisses from the audience. They just quite right. <laughs> no. Queensland Labor Minister Keith Wright was refusing to step down after several sex charges wouldn't affect his work, and they show footage of a man uh, covered entering a police station. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, he once he did his time, he went to Vietnam and died there. Oh, boy. Fun. France and Aussie boxer Jeff Harding made history remembering the words to the Australian national anthem, well, four words at least. <laughs> <laughs> Let's carry on from episode 18 where they're highlighting the fact that not many people knew the Australian national anthem. An Indonesian authorities released tape of captured Timor resistance leader Janana, Zanata Janana Gu- Guzmau. Yes. Janana Guzmau. Thank you. But the tape's authenticity were being questioned and then as they showed footage, they had subtitles on there saying certain things, but mainly at the end of it, could you please detach these electrodes from my genitals? So I don't know if that was the fact that in the footage as well you could hear the buzzing noise, which they kind of were, um, which had the white noise behind it. I think those resistance leaders probably did undergo things like torture because the Indonesians really did not like them very much, you might say. Crime news. A man set fire to hair salons where he had bad haircuts. Now, police expect to charge a Mr M Hughes of Victoria, (laughs) (laughs) which was showing their... Picture of Merv with a really bad haircut. Yeah, it was very sort of crew cut like, wasn't it? Almost, yeah. almost, um, no almost, side yeah, almost sort of like a bogan kind of a mulletty <laughs> kind of a monstrosity. <laughs> <laughs> And in royal news, the Duchess of York was invited to spend Christmas with the Queen and her room will be the burnt area of Windsor Castle. The Dodge. Christmas news and gift-buying season is in full swing. The books are popular, especially written by people who have been in jail. Chopper, Edwin John Eastwood and Darren Hinch. And that's why Darren was on Hey Hey It's Saturday last uh, episode. Oh, talking about Because he was promoting his book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of people promoting their books, as we shall shortly see. Product recall and the plastic pull-along pony. The ears can detach, and so kids could actually uh, swallow it. But apart from that, the pony is perfectly safe, and I think that's uh, important to remember any time you'd like to explain it. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. He should just blow something up at the end of every news desk. Probably not not without that much um, lag time. Uh, although it is pretty funny yeah, trying, uh, seeing uh, Tommy G trying to fill in time. Now it's time for a commercial, and it's a nightclub for the over 60s, the artificial hip. Now this yeah. is on the set as empties when they, they did empties a few episodes ago, but, but this time it's, it's for older people. And it seems like every night is jazz night. Um based on the footage that we see of this. But but also Nono Chilaro is back. He's working on the bar. 
And and there's a instead of a wet T-shirt competition, there's a wet incontinence pad um, competition, which gets some kind of <laughs> ew type reactions from the audience. But there is a, an acid house party mix on Wednesday. <laughs> And we see uh, the recurrence of the uh, Zimmer frame and the uh, the old man being <laughs> the, the, yeah from, the, from yeah. The, the death doorstep. Uh, That's right. Sketch last episode. Yes, yeah, so I think there's even a, a geriatric nurse is there as well. Possibly one of the death door employees seems to be hanging around. I do love that they had Australia's choirs band superannuation. <laughs> and sort of similar to, to quite a few sketches that that have been about older people. Like when 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 you were younger, you you would look at sketches like these and think, yeah, you know those bloody old people. I'm never going to be one of those. And um, yeah, you look at it now and you sort of think, gee, I wouldn't mind that actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a jazz <laughs> nightclub I think would be much better f- than than sort of like dance music, incredibly it's loud like, dance music. It's mm. like it's like something to look forward to. Yeah, yeah, get <laughs> me down the hip. Yeah, that's your new business venture. Well, a middle-aged nightclub with just mm. quiet music. Interview time. And we have Rob interviews Jeffrey Wright, the director of Romper Stomper. So this is off the heels of the Romper Stomper success story, I guess. And he's frustrated that he's not being acknowledged for his other works other than the ultra-violent movie Romper Stomper. And so there's a few trailers or a little, a few snippets of some other movies that he's done such as The Man from Snowy River, The Neo-Nazis from Snowy River, and Storm Boy, The Romper Storm Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's... This shows a bunch a of Nazis. Yeah, the Nazis are beating up Mr. Percival, which is which is distasteful. It's quite traumatic. <laughs> it is, yeah. Strictly Ballroom becomes Strictly Stomper, and that's where the Neo-Nazis are roughhousing while the ballroom dancing happens in the background. Classy productions all, I'm sure. Well, also, it was good to have Jeffrey Wright appearing as himself, essentially, and sort of uh, agreeing to go along with it, really. It's time for... Man! The Olden Days, episode 19, The Man with the Olden Gun. Now, I have to say that this is possibly the best part of The Olden Days. Very, very, very clever editing, producing by Tony. Very well written. This whole episode is a great standalone. Oh yes, and the singing. Yes. Well, yeah. Like there's, there's, there's not much to this episode. It's pretty much Sergeant Olden uh, wanting his own series and basically wanting to, you know, play his own sort of version of James Bond. And yeah, it goes into this great song. <laughs> Really catchy. Very Shirley Bassey. I wonder how much the budget was for that song. It's really well done, isn't it? And the, the editing that they have, the sort of clips package showing Olden doing various sort of bond type things, it really, really does capture the essence of an actual Bond sort of, you know, film and, and a real Bond song. Yeah, especially with the stares that they had, Olden, you know, that whole squint the eyes or looking very... <laughs> 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 Very moody esque. Not uh, Allison did that to the camera, and it was there's, there's a particular shot where where his eyes are really like popping with anger, and just does this real glare to the camera, and and they they sort of have that as part of this this clips package. But yeah, it's great. Go go and watch it. Get out your DVD or your VHS copy, and 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 relive the magic. <laughs> mm. Yeah, especially where they had uh, Yoko Ono. Uh, <laughs> yes. Falling in the embrace or like the, oh, my goodness. Yeah, like she, was, she was falling down, but I think they sort of slowed it down a bit and it sort of made it look like she was sort of dropping down in ecstasy or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. at, at, the, at, at, at all of the uh, copious brooding shots of John Waters. Especially right towards the end where as they did the big Sergeant Olden mm-hmm. thing and it has that the grin, the smirk to himself. Yeah. yeah. Come on, ABC, you really need to at least release a Best Bits DVD collection or something like that of Rush. Mm -hmm. We really want to see these in actual context. You think that there's a little bit sort of maybe down the back of iView where they could put out sort of old ABC tat, like, you know, Rush and and old episodes of the Saturday show so we can see the natural seven in their full glory. Mm -hmm. You know, why not? Put some archives out on iView. There must be loads of great stuff. 
Yeah, when it finally happens, we can all celebrate with some warm wombat's piss. Shaken, not stirred. <laughs> Shaken, not stirred. Congratulations, this calls for a warm wombat's piss. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, shaken, not stirred. Indeed. So what do you think of a new image? It's a hit. The men love your 007, just as they shall love me as Miss Moneypenny. <laughs> Bombshell. Now it's time for muckraking and Jason Micker on the couch and Courtney Hogan of Croydon Park, South Australia. Is that anywhere near you? Well, it's, it's a, a real, real suburb. suburb. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. It is. All right, well, this one, um, Courtney has written in to complain about Adelaide TV personality and Wills, and she has won the most amount of state-based Logies, 19 of them. And Mick and Jace break down her fashion style and make fat jokes, really. Pretty much, yeah. That's, and, no, and that's Wills, what the whole segment was. Just to give a bit of context, Anne Wills was the weather woman on Channel 7 in Adelaide, and she was known for sort of being quite a kind of a bit of a character really she she wore very very bright outfits and big big dangly earrings and and every night something different you know something colorful and yeah she she was a i i suppose enduring maybe more than much loved um south australian tv personality indeed one of the few really that that anyone might recognize apart from the odd news reader so I, I suppose a worthy target for taking the piss out of, but but they are possibly a bit mean um, with with some of the some of their suggestions. Um, I, I like the fact that that in the sort of state Logie Award for best um, South Australian talent, she she beat a filing cabinet and a loaf of bread. Uh, they they were the other two two candidates, and there, there's another kind of joke about her dress sense in that um, they suggest that she might be dressed by Daryl Summers, who, of course, was equally famous for his very colourful jumpers. Yeah, I mean, he also addressed someone that was in the street interviews a few issue, a few episodes back. <laughs> <laughs> they show a bit of footage of, of someone working on an outfit for her, and, and it actually looks like one of those AIDS blankets. You know, they used to make these, these blankets where they would memorialise all the victims of AIDS, and they would be these huge, huge blankets that they would display with, with all the victims' names on it. And that that looked to me what the footage was, but but the sort of finale of this sketch is that they they sort of cut through um, a whole bunch of different outfits that she wears in one week, and it, and it ends up with some with some rather odd ones. There's a there's a sort of old fashioned diving costume, is one of them, and then yeah. then the the final joke is is just a cow. Um, yeah, that, that was quite mean. Quite quite mean. Yeah, yeah. and and, it was and, just and a whole bunch also of mean. a comedy gorilla suit as well. A comedy gorilla suit, that's true. Wilsey can really uh, sell used cars as well. There's a, uh, a clip of her on YouTube singing a jingle about, uh, uh, you know, how you can buy a Datsun from Ken Eustace. It's a lovely ad. Back, back, from, back from the 70s, I, I won't hear a bad word about it. next sketch is and it's all about test cricket this is where rob and santo really shine and uh it's the test cricket game uh australia versus the west indies and the entire sketch is based on books published by cricketers instead of actually commentating on the game straight up rob as richie benno tony Gregg and rodney marsh and santo as ian chapel and tony as michael holding but a lot of uh, that is just voice based not actual visual based while they are trying to talk about the actual game itself, they plug their books. There's a hell of a lot of books in this sketch, isn't there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Three-minute sketch. They managed to squeeze in at least 20 books. Well, let, let's start with um, Alan Border. Who, his book is called South of the Border. And then we've got um, All Out War by one of the War Brothers. By both, yeah, both Steve and Mark Wall. Both of Both of the War Brothers. And then Tony, Tony Gregg, while he's doing his pitch report, he pulls out from one of the cracks in the in the pitch his latest book, which is called Grieg Steal or Borrow. So, so another great pun there. Um, and then all of these books, incidentally, are, you know, hilarious collections of um, anecdotes from, from one of the world's favourite cricketers. No, tall, tall tales and anecdotes. Tall tales. tall tales and anecdotes from one of the world's favourite cricketers, yeah. So so there's a whole whole bunch more. I don't know if anyone else wants to read any out. Ian Chappell with 
tied tests and tight tits. <laughs> Richie Benno with from crease to commentary box. And Rod Marsh with bowlers, bouncers, and bulldust. And Michael Holding, Calypso Keepers. And Rod Marsh and Dougie Walters. And it's a sequel from Two of For the Road. It is On the Boundary. And last but not least, before the next lot, <laughs> really, Dean Jones, One Day Warrior. Yeah, and they, they show footage of, of, uh, of Dean Jones uh, getting out. And like even the cartoon duck that walks across the screen, even that duck is carrying a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Odd, oddly enough called ducky for cover <laughs> <laughs> yeah with uh at the time i had no idea who most of these people were but i still found it funny how everyone was just trying to outdo each other with their particular book and it was all tall tales and a- anecdotes from one of cricket's most colorful characters or least yeah. colorful car- characters or whatever it was, and then and then the, the very final scene was where the book actually came in most useful. <laughs> Matt Walker put out a couple of books, I think, late 80s, early 90s, Sydney, with that with that cartoon style, and then then suddenly there was this, this avalanche of books from different cricketers, which I suppose in long term inspired Tom Gleisner's Warwick Todd series. Yeah, and, uh, and, and uh, there's also, uh, don't forget for fans of Get This, uh, Timmy Zura. The gloves are off now. Ah, the, yes. the one bit that I like out of that little scoreboard at the end is that Mark War's book is called My Brother Steve and Steve War's book is called My Brother Mark. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's also Mervilus by Merv Hughes, of course, which is a nice little pun. And then you've got C. McDermott. I don't know who he is. And he's got bouncers and bumpers. Craig McDermott. Craig McDermott. And then you've got B. Reed, and he's got bumpers and bouncers. <laughs> Yeah, Craig McDermott and Bruce Reed. Bruce Reed, okay. Yeah, see, I, I, I don't know that much about cricket because cricket is a beer man sport. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, and we're on the stage now. And since the start of the show, Mick and Tony have decided to change their image and base it on their hero. Oh, it's Billy Ray Cyrus. We're in Billy Ray Cyrus territory. And Mick has changed his name to Mickey Ray Malloy. And Tony has changed it to. The less successful, uh, Tony Ray Martin. Yep, but lots of mail from 65-year-old women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they've released a new single called Ouchy Wouchy Heart. My ouchy Wouchy Heart. Oh, oh yes. It's, it's such a well-known song, isn't it, um, Ouchy Wouchy Heart? There's a wonderful bit where um, the cast are up the back of this this music video, um, dancing, doing some line dancing. And, and I particularly like Rob in his grey wig doing some very, very crappy line dancing with, yeah, <laughs> and, and the, with a funny face as well. Yeah, he loves it really. <laughs> is, is, is it on YouTube, this one? I'm, it's certainly on the DVDs anyway, so, so yeah. dig out and have a look. Yeah, I remember um, being really excited when I was in year 11 and some of the year 10s were singing along to it and thinking, oh, my gosh, they also are in on it. It was really popular at school, just everyone singing this song. But, yes, I actually have a copy of Smash Hits from uh, no, 25th of November 1992, so it would have actually been the issue that was out when um, when this episode aired. And there's some uh, – they also list the charts, which are a little bit behind, so let's just say that um, there's probably a couple of weeks out. But at the time, um, Achy Breaking Heart was at number one, and it had been in the charts for 13 weeks. So by that stage, I oh, think pretty God. much everyone had had enough of this and the Ouchie Wouchie Heart version was probably a welcomed version to hear yeah, it on the radio yeah, all the this, time. This, ex- this explains the late show's hatred for it pretty much. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, thankfully, I do have um, in my collection the 6th of January issue. It had gone down to like number four or five at that point. So it was slowly starting to slide down the uh, the single chart at the, at the time. Um, but uh, just have a, a quick uh, rundown of what was actually in the charts. Um, Best Things in Life, uh, Luther and Janet. Uh, three, Erotica by Madonna. Uh, Day You Went Away, Wendy Matthews. Ain't No Doubt by Jimmy Nail. End of the Road, Boys to Men. Um, so that was just some of the, the top songs. And in terms of albums, um, Madonna was still enjoying some success with Erotica, and we'll actually hear a little bit of that later on in the Christmas party <laughs> sketch. Um, mm-hmm. And Prince and the NPG was st- still uh, quite popular with the Love Symbol album, which we discussed a couple of issues. But unfortunately, Billy Ray was at number three with uh, Some Gave All, and he has been in the chart for the albums for 10 weeks. 
Mm. And was up from number four. And yeah, the clip, the clip, Ouchie Wouchie Heart is on YouTube. Great. Now we have a sketch. And now this is a, I don't know who he's taking the mickey out of, but Rob is dressed up as some generic producer and he goes to basically describe what the next setup is. You know, I was thinking the other day, I was thinking about all the awards night in Australia. We've got like, we've got the Arias, we've got the Logies. Got the AFIs, People's Choice the other night. Good show, good show. Credit where credit's due. No, he did a good job. And I was thinking, you know what we need in Australia? We need more awards nights. That's what we need. Industry should get the credit it deserves. So I was thinking, I was thinking to myself, what awards night? And then it came to me. It just went bang. And I said, we need an awards night for awards nights. Do you think this was triggered because of the recent, at the time, People's Choice Awards? Probably. Yeah, de- definitely that. And uh, as I mentioned in, in the program guide, um, uh, in the week that uh, the Late Show had off, uh, they had the Australian Music Awards, or sorry, I should say the Coca Cola Australian Music Awards. Like uh, as yes. far as I can tell, yeah, there, there was there were quite a lot of arbitrary awards nights. Well, uh, advertising opportunities masquerading as awards nights, like the People's Choice, like the the Australian Music Awards. They were a very popular thing to watch, though, because, you you know, you could see all your favourite personalities in the one night and and hopefully they would get drunk and do something embarrassing. Um, They sort of of became less drunk as the 90s progressed because they realised that actually it could be genuinely have some bad long-term effects on their career if they were, if they did, you know, they were incredibly drunk, but but yeah, certainly the, their reputation was built on those classic drunken evenings um, of the Logie Awards, for example, back in the seventies. Yeah, you wouldn't want to set fire to wickety whack. <laughs> As our entertainment <laughs> options were quite limited back then, watching these award nights were probably pretty much the highlight of any teenager's week. <laughs> mm. Maybe I just had a very sad life, but I, I remember recording the ARIA Awards and all those other other things that went on, Logies, et cetera. So, yeah. But this particular sketch is is really good because it just uh, has all those cliched um, occurrences that happen whenever an, awards, an award is given out. So contrived look of surprise, really sexist kind of uh, dialogue between a couple of people, um, And my favourite one was the really bad photograph for people who can't attend (laughs) the yarn (laughs) yarn event. (laughs) Yeah, well, my favourite one was the, as you're saying, the stilted one, but it was the, what do you call it, the sexist one, but it was mainly because it was stilted. Uh, What can I say, uh, Trace? You're looking ravishing. (laughs) Why, thank you. Uh, And I wouldn't mind doing some (laughs) ravishing tonight. Oh, come off it. (laughs) (laughs) And we're proud to accept this award for the most sexist, stilted and embarrassingly contrived jokes at an award ceremony. Stilted? I'm not wearing skirts. Yeah, that, that's nice because Jane does that, that classic awards night thing of, of leaning really, really close into the little microphones <laughs> on the, on the page every time she speaks, even though there's no need to do that. Mm, yeah. Oh, come off it. <laughs> that, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. My, my favourite of these awards is the, is the most ridiculously designed award award. And, and the, <laughs> the winner has got like a rotating part on the award, which is absolutely... <laughs> Yeah, it looks like one of those uh, kids' toy mower things, you know, that goes tick, 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 tick. Exactly tick. what it looks like. It's great. They're all quite well-dressed in this episode. I think if Prue were here, she'd be quite impressed by uh, the standard of uh, <laughs> clothes that they're wearing. And a nervous Rob as well, the one who gets highly emotional. Yes, the uh, most overly emotional speech for an award that doesn't really mean that much. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it's, 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 worth, it's worth watching that just to see the wig that Rob's wearing and yeah. that uh, bit of the sketch. There's some brilliant wig work and, and in fact, um, top marks to whoever gave Santo Tolari that silver jacket with the fur trim. That that is one of one of the most awful dinner jackets I've ever seen. Now we have the couch and Jane and Tommy G are there and Jane talks about hair removal. I am going to let <laughs> Alison and Kim talk about this one. <laughs> well, I guess being about fifteen or sixteen at the time, this is the the time where I was experimenting with such things as well, and realizing that uh, that horrible cream that you put on that literally dissolves your hair. Um, is pro- probably oh, the is Chernobyl. Made in Chernobyl. In fact, <laughs> <laughs> this segment is all about hair removal. 
basically. So, so yeah, Jane, Jane runs through the different options and yeah, I was the same, Kim. I, I was trying out depilatory cream, which is the one possibly made in Chernobyl. And <laughs> that it was weird because you put it on and, and sometimes it didn't work. So you still had the hairs on your leg, but, but other times you, eat, so you think, Oh, I'll leave it on later. And then you burn your skin. So there's, there's basically, there's obviously like a really tiny middle ground to get yeah, there. You never quite get it right. And it, and it really stunk as well. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. It was very, very smelly. I, I never tried wax strips, which was one of the other ones that she tried. And I think that was because I just couldn't, I actually, I just couldn't, I just didn't have the guts to rip the wax off myself. I don't know if you ever tried that, Kim. I didn't try that wax in a jar. Um, you put it in the microwave and then you have this fabric stuff and it was, yeah, it was, it, you had to be really careful that the wax wasn't particularly uh, hot. Um, but you can make toffee <laughs> toffee yes, afterwards, yes. which is really disgusting. It, it just had an audible groan from the audience because obviously the toffee would be mixed with um, hair as well. It wouldn't just be yes, the, it, the unused portion from the, the it jar. It was such a, a disgusting-looking prop that uh, Jane brought out there. Yes. yes a, be- a beautiful hair garnish on top of each of the, the toffees. The, the next one is um, electrolysis, which which again is is quite a painful procedure. I've I've never had electrolysis, um, but th- this is this is before they had laser hair removal, which is a bit apparently is is a lot less um, painful than electrolysis was, and that that was literally they would sort of run an electric current over the hairs and and kill them, um, which doesn't sound very pleasant. I've I've never had that. And then the final one was the Folly Smooth, which is one of those gadgets that used to get um, advertised on, on shows like Good Morning Australia, you know, those kind of morning shows where they'd flog off all these things. And and it was basically, it was like a sort of spiral thing that would catch the hairs in it as you ran it over and kind of yank them out, which, yeah. which must be an extraordinarily painful thing to, to put on your body. And they tried. Oh, yeah. I, th- I think, I think they're, they're, they're called epilators, I think. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, so, so, certainly, certainly the, the the brand name is Epilady. Yeah. Again, again, I'm not a beer drinker. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have tried that, and it's yeah, it's not pleasant. It is literally just yanking them out with these wires that just kind of twist around your hair. So yeah, it's Ooh, quite disgusting, gosh. and um, yeah, very painful. Uh, Jane did put it on Tommy. Tommy, leg up, please. Come on. <laughs> I've got to do. It. <laughs> I'm not scared. It, it's not scared. Men do that all the time. Yeah. All right, you ready? Be gentle with me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, um, yeah, that's that's effective. <laughs> <laughs> just cuts his leg. Yeah, off. I think the the funny thing about that was you were expecting it to be this horrible experience where it's it's kind of like is it in the forty year old ver- version where he gets the the wax? Is, yeah. it, is it is that the movie? Yeah. So you kind of think, oh my god, he's going to have his hair yanked out, and then you get the the blood. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> and that it's quite a lot of blood as well. Yeah. Yes. But you know, Tony did mention subtle, sophisticated entertainment, just the way you like it at home here on the Late Show. <laughs> There's also another bit where she brings out a whippersnipper. <laughs> but now Tony, after his a little ribbing there, he does bring up that Tony and Mick went on a field trip to Studio City in Melbourne, which is a TV museum. He says it's in it's uh, that they went to Mornington, which I assume that's the Mornington Peninsula. I've actually been to this place, so I can tell you all about it if you like. Oh, please. Yeah, please do. Yeah, okay. So so Studio City, or as it's also known, the Australian Museum of Modern Media, it, it's a museum that, that at the time in the 90s was on the Mornington Peninsula, just, just outside the town of Mornington just off the highway there. And I went there because I, I've i got relatives who live in Mornington. They said, oh, we've got this great new museum. We'll, we'll take you there. And and essentially it was just a, a little building um, that was on, w- was part of a business park. You know, those business parks where there's like a lot of sort of, you know, companies have their offices and there's a few warehouses there and stuff like that. And they'd obviously just like, you know, rented one of these business sort of block things and, and they just filled it with, um, you know, memorabilia. It's mostly from Channel 9. Now, the woman who started this, um, she she's still with us. Um, her name is Judy Phillips. She used to be known as Judy Banks before she got married. And, and she worked um, on the Fred Bear Breakfast at Go-Go program, which was a breakfast TV thing in the early 70s. And she worked at Channel 9 back then. And, and while she was working at Channel 9, she collected all of these things. 
So when I went to visit this museum in the early 90s, I didn't really know very much about Paul Hogan and and some of the other personalities because, you know, I was about 10 when I saw all this. But um, one of the things that that they do see um, at this museum is Dexter from Perfect Match. And I certainly knew who Dexter was um, in the early 90s. But but really, this is quite an impressive collection of stuff. Um, we've got Judith Durham's tambourine. They've got a, a prop from the Paul Hogan show, which is basically a Foster's can that that's actually a, a phone. Um, they've got stuff that relates to people like Ernie Sigley, um, Burton Patty Newton, you know, Ozzy Ostrich, all sorts of things. So um, it's it's a really great collection. Um, unfortunately, the museum doesn't exist anymore. However, much of the collection was moved to ACME, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image, which is which is in Melbourne. So you can see a lot of Judy's collection there. But yeah, Mick and Tone have a lot of fun at this museum. Um, they they make some pretty good jokes and observations while they're there. And and yeah. It was fun to visit. Although, although some of the jokes uh, that Mick and Tony make seem to just go right over Judy's head. <laughs> yes. Oh, like the Mark Chopper Reed dancer? <laughs> yeah. She's like, oh, okay. Yeah. But they were celebrating Australia's most fondly remembered TV shows. Maybe you and I were walking through an arcade. <laughs> wow. Gotta love that funk. Yep. That's yeah. That was arcade. That's yeah, ge- yeah. genuine nineteen eighty non ratings TV. Let's not forget the uh, original Mick Malloy prototype, which is a house <laughs> there. Which has just yeah. Mick. he's just in the in yeah. the window. And also the German assault vehicle from the Sullivans. Yeah, and with uh, Rolf Harris's wobble board as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was at about the point where Judy wobbles that wobble board that I sort of thought. Maybe this is Piss Week TV world. <laughs> it kind of is really, isn't it? it, it you know, e- even when I went to see this and I didn't, I, I thought it was a bit Piss Week to be honest, but then I, I didn't really know very much about who Graham Kennedy was at that point. So so I couldn't really relate to it, but it, it, did, it did have a bit of an air of Piss Weakness, as you can see from the footage. So were you actually allowed to wobble the board? <laughs> Judy just had... She was basically just wobbling it, and I thought it was going to explode or something. <laughs> I suppose it's her wobble board. She can do what she likes with yeah. it, but, you know, technically it's a museum object and you, you shouldn't. Mm-hmm. But. They also, uh, Mick and Tony sort of stick the boot into Izzy Die, saying that there's like a rare photo of him. Uh, it's the only time that he was asked for an autograph, <laughs> which I'm sort of wondering, what, what did Izzy Die ever do to you two? Oh, we also find out that Fred Bear is now a TV producer. And uh, produced Bert's Midday Show, which, again, that was another failed TV enterprise. Uh, yeah, Bert Newton had a, a, a daytime show on Channel 7 uh, from memory. It was about 88, wasn't it? And, yeah, it lasted yeah, for like about... Late, late 80s, yeah. It's time for commercial crime stoppers and Mick, Santo, and they've brought out Rob as well. They bring out Rob because they just want to highlight how awesome Rob is at his impressions. Tell them, how about one of my favourites, one from... The American presidential debate. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give okay. Right. okay. That's why I got in this campaign in the first place. I did. Ah, oh, that's just. <laughs> that is the best George Bush you will ever get. Fantastic. <laughs> now it's a special treat. That was George do, do, Bush. Do 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 your. <laughs> why don't do your Perot? You know your popper pants. <laughs> <laughs> do do popper pants. That was my favourite. Do the do the tiger. <laughs> I'm a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> he does them all, folks. Now, he does them all. Who now, taught you? Who taught you? That's now, what we want to know. Now you're just starting to pull the piss out. <laughs> <laughs> you, it was all right today. You said, Rob, let's go. <laughs> Come on, commercial crime stoppers. We've been so impressed with your work, and you just pull the piss out. Of <laughs> they get Rob out mainly for this one person, Rocky. The Pine King. Yeah, it's amazing how many ads that uh, uh, Rocky put out that they were able to craft a whole segment out of it. Uh, Rob had a reputation by then for doing some great characters, so he was the perfect person to bring out to uh, explain that he actually learned his craft through Rocky the Pine King and his series of advertisements. <laughs> Great, even 
interesting characters in there. He he Rocky the Pine King, he's a bit like Ken Bruce in that he's got a range of characters. He he's a he's a Maori doing the hacker. He's a schoolboy, he's a pirate, he's a judge, he's an Arab. He, he plays a Chinese man, a Native American, an Italian, and also Humphrey Bogart. So, so what a what a what a hilarious and brilliant range of mostly racist characters there. But you know what I did discover though, right? Out of all the things uh, that he's played, this is him normally, okay? And not promoting pinking stuff, but it's a commercial I found, and he's promoting carpet. And when you find the commercial, which I'll tweet out the YouTube video for, <laughs> he's reading off the auto cue on the side of the camera so he's not making direct eye contact just listen very carefully i'm rocky the pine king are you looking for a reliable cleaning company well the bendigo cleaning service has been operating in bendigo for over 10 years and are experts in their field specializing in all types of industrial domestic and commercial cleaning it's so simple they can transform your dirty carpet to look fresh and clean Ring now for another So when you said King yeah. became so famous that he could do ads for other companies. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And not very well it seems. <laughs> yes. They will clean your carpets. Yeah, that that needs a few Salam Malakas and Uyghur Volts in there to be a bit more popular, yeah. I think. <laughs> Some of the laughs uh, to be had in, in the montage that, that the commercial crime stoppers play is just in, in the in the, the shock of, of all of these yeah, very base stereotypes. Oh, well, I don't think those ads would get made today, but if they were, I think a few of them would cause international incidents. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Definitely. Oh, yes. I think at the time people were starting to recognise that these are products that should be of their time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, when they say, mm-hmm. oh, Rocky is just a normal white guy, who would have thought that he's... Oh, gosh. Yeah. And Santo did say that he was inspired with his Italian from Rocky when he was playing an Italian. But I'm not going to play the audio <laughs> grab. It's a bit too much. The main thread throughout this commercial crime stuff is segment is that they seem to be sort of laughing at him and with him. Yeah, mm. The other thing to note is that furniture was really bad back then. <laughs> <laughs> Like those, yes. three, those three piece kind of chairs and table sets. Oh. You know what? Imagine if Rocky the Pine King and Ken Bruce teamed up. Yeah, you could get you, out you your whole house. Whole, yeah, with, yeah, with really <laughs> dreadful stuff. I, I'm just I'm just really thankful that we've got IKEA these days because IKEA might might be a bit, but at least it looks okay. Now, time for the toilet break, and Tony sets up a very raunchy, magnificent seven at, with. Music to watch girls by. Standing on the corner, watching all the girls go by. Rather you don't know a nicer occupation. Matter of fact, neither do I. Then standing on the corner, watching all the girls. Watching all the boys. Watching all the girls go by. I just love that. It's yeah. beautiful, isn't it? I, I'm just trying to work out whether the the boys from the Natural Seven are beer men or not, because because <laughs> they're they're beer men because they like chicks, but but dancing around is probably not something a beer man would do. So, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Maybe they're shandy men. <laughs> yeah, half, yeah. Half, half and half. Yes. Seven seven, <laughs> but yeah, and, and this, oh. is, this is pretty much this is uh, a mashup before mashups were a thing because yeah, it's it's music to watch girls by, but yeah, it's also uh, again uh, uh, questioning about whether it's a, a beer man sort of a thing. Uh, it's mixed with the show tune called "Standing on the Corner." Tony then reveals that one of the natural seven was actually in the audience, and that was Mr. Max Brown in his original brown suit. He looked yeah. great, didn't he? He looked like he hadn't aged a, a second. And yeah, wearing, yeah. Wearing, the, wearing the same outfit as as shown in the toilet break clip. And yeah, it's it's a, a whole variety of brown. Like sort of <laughs> like like remember the the Martin Malloy Brown album where you, you you take the book and unfold it and it's got that sort of paint chart of different browns. And yeah. They're trying to get the right shade of brown. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. like. Max Brown's, it's, it's, it's ironic that it's called Max Brown, I've just realised. <laughs> <laughs> his his range of Browns is, is better than the Brown album range of Browns. All right, now we have a sketch uh, which is one of the favourites, which wasn't featured on any of the best bits or anything like that, and that is the office Christmas party with Tommy G presenting all the different scenarios and people that would be stereotyped in 
an office Christmas party. Now, the first one we have uh, the office sucks, the office suck ups, uh, hanging around the boss and laughing at all his jokes. Oh, and oh, what a pity Prue's not around. Oh, John Harrison. This is John Harrison overload. Yeah, yeah John Harrison so, plays the, the boss in this sketch and, and all the rest of the cast are the various staff members at this office. And if you want to know what John Harrison sounds like. Boy, this uh, fruit cup really knocks you around a bit. I suppose that's why they call it punch. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I'll uh, have to be going home soon. My wife's seriously ill. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think we've all done that, trying to suck up to the boss by laughing at jokes or agreeing with what they say or whatever. Yeah, and I do, don't think that office Christmas parties are quite like this nowadays. They're a bit more subdued, but I do remember in the late 90s some... some with some pretty hilarious antics that I, at the time when I watched this, I thought, oh, no, this isn't the type of stuff that goes on. Oh, yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) These are are all HR trigger warnings, Mm. like uh, the office sleaze. And, and you know, you know what I I really, really like about you? My eyes. Your tits. (laughs) (laughs) I'll drop the Dax, I'll drop the Dax if you want me to. No, (laughs) dear. This sketch is pretty much uh, just an excuse for everybody to really ham it up and act drunk, uh, except for John Harrison, who seems to be extremely straight-laced as that boss. Like, like Jane? Uh, oh, yeah. So I've got the grab. Yeah, go I've on, got the go grab. On. Now, the, um... <laughs> yeah, so Jane playing the office slut. Yeah. See, I... And I've, I've lived a bit of a deprived life, actually, because I've never been to an <laughs> office Christmas party that descends quite to this level. You know, firstly, office Christmas parties that I've always been to, they've always been at a restaurant or a pub or something. So, you know, you, can, you don't have the opportunity to stand on a filing cabinet or photocopy your bar or any, any of that sort of stuff. Right? <laughs> and and secondly, maybe I just have never worked with anyone good looking enough, but but no one seems to be hitting on each other or, or getting into fights or anything like that. You know, it's all just kind of reasonably pleasant drinking, essentially. No, you haven't lived. <laughs> I, you're right. I, I need to change jobs immediately. Did anyone give you a photocopy of their bum? No. No, be- because, ah. like, I've, I've never been to an office Christmas party where that happens, but also there's, there's a thing that, you know, a- apparently if you sit on the photocopier with your bare ass, you might break it because of your body weight because they're not they're designed to take <laughs> individual pieces of paper, not a whole body. So... I always thought, oh, I don't, I don't want to photocopy my bum because I, I'd smash <laughs> through the glass and that would really hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason why. <laughs> That's the only reason I've never done it. Yeah. The only reason I've never photocopied my ass is because the photocopier is nowhere. Uh, that's in a, a private area. It's all, it's all, it's all open plan offices. Open plan offices <laughs> killed off the photocopy dance. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Oh. The running joke here is uh, that Tony is the one that has photocopied his bum, and he's like, "Oh yeah, here's here's your leaving um, frame. <laughs> what do you call it? Stuff again. Oh, here's I, your I, leaving I, present. I love that it's framed. <laughs> yes. Yeah." yeah. <laughs> Office relationships do come to an end, especially with uh, the woman confessing her crush to Mick. And then Mick goes, oh, that's great, but I'm standing next to my wife. <laughs> and, and then and uh, can, can, you, can, can you tell that the, the, the wife is obviously played by somebody that's been dragged out of the audience because they sort of, again, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but she sort of shields her face from the camera. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> did, didn't Mick also say she's a babe? I think he did, yeah. But there's also times during the office Christmas party where you do need to get things off your chest. Ah, I gotta tell you. <laughs> I think your company is stuck. <laughs> and you're shit, and I couldn't give a stop about this place. I hate it. I hate your company, and you can go and get stuck. <laughs> Well, you're certainly the most forthright work experience kid we've ever had. <laughs> Again, so so understated from John Harrison there. Yeah, I noticed that Rob was just laughing into his foam cup quite hilariously when uh, <laughs> when yeah. Jane was uh, doing her little farewell speech. They just keep doing the ah, the, gra- the growling or yelling, <laughs> <laughs> trying to cover up their laughs. <laughs> it's quite a nice joke. They had a lot of fun. It's quite a nice joke around the the character of, of Jane's character leaving, and and you know Shelley is leaving us unfortunately because she was sacked. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just want to read a few comments on the YouTube video, which I posted. I actually posted the video clip of this and it's had nearly 80,000 views in the past 12 years, which I guess isn't that much when you add, <laughs> when you take how, how many people have watched per year. But anyway. Um, Is that better or worse than our podcast? <laughs> oh, it's, yeah, that's true. Someone do the math. <laughs> 100% up on last year, Daniel. <laughs> Someone hoped that Tony signed those pictures. Um, it's funny to see a more restrained Rob on shows like Hollow Men and Utopia. Back in the late show days, he had three gears, big, humongo, and chewed scenery. <laughs> and uh, R Jane, you still do it for me big time. And Rob doing some of the best forced laughing I've ever heard. <laughs> oh, and of course, there's Prue saying, John Harrison, you are so cute. Where are you now? <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for Piss Week World. And oh, funny, Tony was part of this one. We have various things going on at Piss Week Movie World. Movie World open, like actual Warner Brothers Movie World, which ends up being a piss take later on uh, in season two. Movie World did open on the 1st of June 1991. This is a prime piss take, really, early days. Some of the things that are mentioned were part of this, I guess, the studio tour of Movie World at the time because you can visit the original set of The Towering Inferno and it has Tom with paper on fire hanging from the second floor window. <laughs> Until it turns his fingers and he drops it. Yeah. <laughs> A lightsaber battle with Darth Vader that has Tom in a mask holding a broomstick and torch. <laughs> Climb aboard the Memphis Bell, and that's basically everyone shoved in a trolley with cardboard wings. That's such a dated reference to the Memphis Bell. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, that was part of the Warner Brothers studio tour at Movie World. So you, um, someone from the audience was allowed to sit in the cockpit of uh, Memphis Bell in front of a, in front of a blue screen. And the way they shot it, you look up on the screen and it's like, hey, flying. Also, uh, Tommy G dressed up as Edward Scissorhands with a shonky wig and scissors. Yeah. <laughs> and what's in that gully trap? It's a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's got Tom wearing a green bin bucket and holding a pizza box with a rain bandana over his eyes. And the state-of-the-art special effects where it's got a kid planking on an auto bin wearing a Superman costume and Tom's... Flicking the cape. And you don't forget to watch out for Jaws. Yeah, the, yep. the Jaws is about as realistic as it was in the film, to be fair. Yeah. <laughs> Sharks come and go, Ellen. <laughs> you can actually feel what it's like to be home alone. And there's a kid just looking through a window. <laughs> Doing that expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can take part in a car chase where it's got kids in the back of the ute driving about 5Ks an hour. <laughs> and <laughs> this one's great. Taste Paul Newman's salad dressing. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Actually not bad. <laughs> that's that's scraping the bottom of the barrel though, in terms of just <laughs> And visit Little House on the Prairie, which is just a wooden letterbox. <laughs> Take a stroll down Hollywood Boulevard. And the three superstars are Charles Bud Tingwell, Gus Mercurio, and the Pelican from Stormboy. All chalked on the footpath as well. That's pretty piss weak, isn't it? But here's the one thing, right? I can't remember who told the story. Someone was explaining that Charles Bud Tingwell with his name. Is Bud meant to be in brackets or in the quotation marks? No, I think that was Tony Martin, and I think it is meant to be Bud in brackets. It's a, a, a chapter in Tony Martin's ebook called Scarcely Relevant. And yeah, it's a whole chapter about Charles Bud Tingwell called Bud in Brackets, which he wrote a few weeks after the passing of, uh, of Charles Bud Tingwell. Here's the, the relevant section. Uh, is it but in quotation marks or parentheses, I immediately asked, having been irritated for 25 years by this inconsistency in his on-screen credit. It's but in brackets, he replied, seemingly nonplussed by such a nerdish inquiry, or at least it's supposed to be. Really? So it's wrong then most of the time? I get sick of asking them to correct it. So it's always been but in brackets? Back in the early days, that's what they called me, but in brackets. Some even shortened it to just brackets. Brackets? Would you mind if I called you Brackets? I'd rather you didn't. <laughs> In addition to containing Charles Bud Tingwell's most famous role, the castle marks one of the few times where his name is formatted correctly in the credits. Aww. Nice. Now it's time for those intellectual sporting partners, Graham and the Colonel. Now this one is a train wreck. <laughs> Again, <laughs> right from the outset. So Graham and the Colonel are late as they were getting fitted into their Richie Richardson hats. Well, there's about three cricket fans in the audience, <laughs> <laughs> which makes it 
perhaps feel good because most of it tonight is cricket. Yep. Okay. <laughs> a dry and proper the giant hat. I think what they're referring to there is is the sort of muted response that that sketch about all the cricketing books got because it, it didn't get a huge number of laughs from the studio audience, probably because they, well, I guess, weren't cricket fans and didn't get the reference. They also talk about golf at the Johnny Walker Classic and it's the last time that the little lieutenant, <laughs> the colonel's nephew. Love that nickname. Uh, yeah, that's the last time they're trying to uh, they're going to take him because he couldn't jump the fences as easy as they can. <laughs> Pretty much sneaking in, yeah. But he did help them get around the two can limit. <laughs> there was a flummoxed. Now, big hats, they always work. Come on. <laughs> I can't believe we got kicked out of the golf today. I just cannot believe it. I mean, we were there, we were having a good time, and then we got, just got kicked out. You're a little late, but you came in anyway. <laughs> good <on you. laughs> Is that what you're waiting for? <laughs> no, I was just sitting out here with my Richie Richardson hat having a really good time. I can't believe we got kicked out of the golf. How did we get kicked out of the golf? Stop it, Colonel! Hang on, I've got, to, I've got to change moods. Yeah, and a, a, a return to those hats as well. They, they sort of... Yeah, they, they put them on and then realise they can't read the auto cue if they've got those big hats on. After that... The colonel did a double take and he was wrong. Watching Robert Allenby over on at the 18th, this is still golf, by the way, it's just not the time to start a Mexican wave. They go back to the well of the, of the cricket books. <laughs> again, there's another mention of Rocky the Pine King. Again, again it's, that sort of, it's that thing where they, 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 can't, they can't leave this sort of stuff alone without sort of having to go and comment on it and, and crack each other up, which I love. Uh, but, yeah, then they, they mention uh, that Graham and the Colonel have uh, released their own book called The Power of Two, and then the Colonel pulls out uh, his own solo effort called Pulling Rank. Which, again, great puns there. The colonel is going, uh, well, he mentions that he has been reading the Faraday book and it's difficult to read a book about kidnapping. <laughs> That's when he opens up the book and he shows the pages where it's all written out like a ransom note. Yeah, all, mm -hmm. all cut, up, cut up words out of the newspaper and, yeah, the, the reaction it got was deserved. But then they change course and they talk about Phil Cleary because they want to know if things have been settled with Phil Cleary. Mm -hmm. Section 44 of the Constitution on, actually on, goes. Section 44. Hang on, hang on, Section 44. Come up here and tell us about it if you know. Why was Phil Cleary kicked out of, uh, out of Parliament again? <laughs> I'll put it in plain language for you. Section 44, Clause 4 of the Constitution, going back 300 years. Yeah. Any person holding an office of profit under the Crown, receiving a pension from the Crown or a revenue from the Commonwealth shall be deemed ineligible to run for Parliament or sit as a Senator or a member of the House of Representatives. But don't be too literal about it. Profit doesn't mean profit. Profit means office. That's the law. Written and authorised by... <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? I don't know. Who is that? He's but the most surprising people have a grasp of constitutional it's law. Oh it's my the bond. God, it's Phil Cleary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do you know he's wearing like oh. headphones, kind of like Grey when the Colonel wear them, but of course this is a reference to the fact that Phil Cleary was indeed a sports commentator. One of his many, many jobs. Uh, it's pretty impressive, the fact that he... It was like his right of reply in a way. Yeah, I, I thought it was interesting that they got him on because I reckon if if they got someone in a similar position on this kind of show these days, there'd be a real outrage in, in the right-wing media about this because, yeah, they say, oh, it's ABC political bias and all this kind of stuff of letting this guy on and giving him a free ride. And they, they'd probably really have a go at the ABC for doing that. But, but back in the early 90s, no one really cared that much about that stuff. Sort of thing. Just like having a KFC bucket on stage. Yeah. yeah. Benson, Benson and Hedges, Hedge, <laughs> yeah. There's also the Queen had offered to pay tax. Now, this is a pearler. The Windsors have family accountants, Sir H&R Block. <laughs> or or as, HRH Block. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but other than that, they did bring out uh, Phil Cleary again. Hang on, Graham. This guy's wants a... What, what does he want to get? This Phil's back. What's up? Well, what have Phil? you got to do? Well, it's been a big night for books. And oh, I'm no. No. You're kidding. Not enough. Called out. Called <laughs> out. <laughs> What a great way to round it up. I, I like and the detail. He, a very funny three days in Parliament. So obviously he only managed to spend three days in Parliament before this guy, Ian Sykes, sort of lodged this court case and he was out. And the, the court yeah. was dragged on for six months and, and now we get to this point where he definitely 
has been found against. Perhaps just just to to, to bring this segment to an end, it, it's it's great that one they were able to get Phil to come on, and second of all, uh, to get him to take the piss out of himself. And finally, we have the closing, and everyone's sitting on the stage. And they do point out that, you know, they want us to know what is the worst job to have. And someone had sent this in and Tony decides to read it out. Being the receptionist at this place, Benson, Anderson, Smith, Erdekar, Crawford, Simmons, Edwards, Gangbully, Buckley, Timbury, Clark, Hopkins, David, Sir Hannon, Hoyle, Tan, Robinson, Benson, White and Hayward, diagnostic radiologist. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a screenshot of that from the phone book. So that was pretty impressive. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I imagine if you rang up that particular diagnostic radiologist, you'd probably just get hello radiologists or something like that rather than the whole list. <laughs> but, you know, that's a bit of pedantry there. It's a good, it's a good joke. The pedantry ruins the joke. Yeah, the re- Reality is a bit more simple, so they're normally known as Benson Radiology. And there's a little bit of a bio on their website about how it was formed in 1958 by Dr. W. In brackets, Bill H. Benson. So there you go, not in quotes. <laughs> As an X-ray department within a private hospital, it goes on and on about where it moved in 1962. Where Does it, it moved say to what the... happens to the other 19 people that are in that uh, phone stick? No, it doesn't. It, it doesn't talk about them. It just talks about the actual building and where it's relocated. And now it's one of the nation's largest private diagnostic imaging providers. In fact, well, well, get, get down to Benson's for, your, for all your diagnostic radiology needs. There <laughs> I've, 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 I've just noticed that there's two Bensons in the phone listing, so yeah, there must be different Bensons. Mm, this one, this one does mention that, that address, so this is the correct one. Um, it does mention all the radiologists who currently work there, and there's probably about thirty or forty of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah. the phone book was actually used nowadays, it would be extremely long. Well, that pretty much wraps up the episode, uh, Season 1, Episode 19 of The Late Show, and also wraps up this episode of the Champagne Comedy Podcast. Oh, the other thing I'll mention is uh, the usual Michael Hirsch credit, and this might be a bit of a hint as to where he might have been in the episode because he's uh, credited as Santa's little helper. I couldn't quite notice whether he was one of the dueling Santas in the, uh, the office Christmas party sketch or not. I'd say he would be. It's also worth noting that there's no announcement about the tickets at the end of this episode. I don't know whether that's because our VHS copy maybe cut off the tickets reference, the tickets plug. Well, there's also the final episode because our next uh, episode is episode 20 and that's the final for the season one. So they might have already got enough people to um, Mm -hmm. have that episode Mm -hmm. because by now, as we mentioned, probably roughly about episode 10 onwards, they've found their ground and they've found the fan base. So I think they'll be in high demand after mm. that. Yeah, they don't need to advertise anymore. Yeah, that pretty much wraps things up. So feel free to, if you've lasted this long, feel free to send us an email, champagnelateshow at gmail.com, as well as Twitter at TLS Champagne. Hit up our uh, website, champagnecomedy.com, just for random bits and pieces and a forum that's got a heartbeat just. <laughs> and uh, there's also the fa- – sorry, I'll, ba- I'll bag it up, but I love it. <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Kim, for keeping everything alive there, <laughs> as well as the Late Show Facebook page. And if you search for Champagne Comedy Podcast as a group on Facebook, uh, we've actually started to have people pop up there. Mm. So we're, we're up to triple digits yeah. now. <laughs> the group forum is on private, so um, just answer the questions and I'll probably just approve it anyway. Next episode, we will reveal the winner of the Late Show Quote Competition. So thank you, everyone who has entered and someone's going to get this Piss Week prize pack eventually. No returnsies, okay? So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, once you go get it, you're stuck with it. It is being sent to you without a receipt. Yes. Yeah. If I get a copy of any questions for Ben opened returned, yeah, there's going to be help. No pay. return address, just <laughs> post it straight. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for downloading, listening. Keep subscribing. we still got one more episode to go, and hopefully everyone will be back for the final episode. So I just want to say thank you so much, Alison, Daniel, and Kim, for coming tonight. Thanks. That's okay. Great to be here. Keep listening, and we'll catch you next episode. See you later. I'm Matthew. Have a great time. Talk to you soon. Bye. 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 Subtle, sophisticated entertainment just the way you like it at home here on The Late Show.
<laughs> Thank you for listening to the Champagne Comedy Podcast, created by fans for the fans. For more information on this podcast, please visit champagnecomedy.com. Produced by Matt Fulton Productions, mattfulton.com.au.